Hey friend, what you doing? It's me, Debbie Marvell, back again with another video. Thank you guys so much for clicking on this video. Go ahead and do me a favor and hit that thumbs up button for me. And I hope by the time that we get to the end of this journey, you guys all like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> today we are talking about Love and Hip Hop Hollywood, season four, episode six. So let's get into it, shall we? What, what? So we will start off with Alexis Skye's business. So she wasn't really actually in this episode, but Solo Lucci was. And Solo Lucci is going to meet up with his baby mama, Sarah, to talk to her about why she pulled up on Alexis at her photo shoot and why she's even in LA in the first place when she is supposed to be in Atlanta, okay? Taking care of their son, because he ain't got time to. Just kidding. Off the rip, it is just not, not a peaceful conversation. I don't think it was a, hey, how you doing? How you been? Haven't seen you in a while. No, they just start going at it like two chihuahuas. Like it was a mess. And Solo Lucci wants to know why she's out here acting a fool and why she's even out here in the first place. Solo says she just popped up, didn't even tell him. She's saying that, you know what, as soon as you started messing with Alexis, you stopped calling your son. And he says, that's because you've been acting crazy. And she's like, so what? I want to say, yeah, she's right. So what? But at the same time, I kind of feel like, ladies, you can't be sitting here and putting your baby daddy through a whole bunch of bullshit and making him jump through all kinds of hoops to spend time with their child and then expect them to, I guess, make, um, you know, I guess keep trying to make an effort. I don't know. It's complicated. It is complicated. Because I, I, on the other hand, I do feel like you do need to make that effort no matter what the case is. I don't know. I don't even know who's telling the truth at this point because Solo Lucci swears that he is a great father, but, you know, let Sarah tell it. She says that he's an Instagram father. Now, if y'all want to know what an Instagram father is exactly, I will tell you. Now, an Instagram father is a guy who only spends time with his kids, you know, every once in a blue moon so that he can get some good shots and pictures of him, like, taking them out and put a caption under it that says, oh, I take care of mine, or I would do anything for them. And, you know, it's a cute little picture. You know, it really ups his factor. So Solo keeps insisting that he is a great father and Sarah keeps denying that. And then she brings up the fact that he said that he was gonna come out here and get them a two bedroom apartment. He denies that. He denies that they were together when he got with Alexis. She says that they were together. And we all know how these stories go. It's, you know, it's one side, the other side, and then the truth. So, you know, three sides, every story, so. But the one thing that did kind of alarm me about this whole situation was when she said that Solo Lucci did not sign his son's birth certificate. And I'm like, okay, well, for what possible reason could that be? Solo tells us that he had a situation before this situation with a chick and she lied to him about her baby being his baby. My thing is, oh, come on. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's no excuse, honey. It is 2017. DNA tests are real, they are a thing, and they are accurate. So if you wanna know if a child is yours, then you can get that figured out. I mean, as soon as the baby pops out, they even have technology these days where you can find out while the baby is still up in the mama. Like, I mean, come on. Do better. So they just keep going at it. Nah, 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 nah. You ain't shit. You ain't shit. And I'm like, God, first of all, er, skirt right there. Okay, Sarah, if he wasn't shit, then girl, why would you travel all the way from the A to LA to be chasing this fool from getting into it, popping up at his new girlfriend's photo shoot to cuss her out? Like, you flew all this way just to cuss him out. You could have done all of this over the phone and saved yourself a trip. But I hope that you are enjoying the sights of LA. I hope you're enjoying your time out there. You know, you're getting your camera time, even though you're out here looking like a fool. But you know, hey girl, do you. So Miss Nikki Baby goes to meet with Hazel E to talk about the whole situation that happened with Hazel E and Chanel. If you remember, Hazel was supposed to be helping Chanel out with her video and that whole situation went left. And according to Miss Nikki Baby, from what she's heard and you know, from what she's gathered, it was all Hazel's fault. Hazel was being too bossy and um, you know, just doing the absolute most which was the case. Miss Nikki Baby comes in and we see Rose Burgundy, Hazel's boo, doing like a little fashion show for Hazel. I guess she's helping him pick out some clothes or whatever. Miss Nikki Baby comes in, she sits down and she's like, so what happened with you and Chanel? And Hazel doesn't actually have a real reason to be beefing with Chanel uh, from Jump Street. She just had this 
problem with Chanel. I guess she felt that Chanel is a fry out here trying to be in the rap game because she tells it Chanel looks like some Coachella chick or whatever. So she obviously feels some type of way about the fact that Chanel is this white girl rapper. After she comes to the conclusion that she ha doesn't have a real reason to be beefing with Chanel, she says to Nikki that, you know, she's gonna try to mend that beef and see if they can come together and figure it out. So Hazel pulls up on Chanel at her video shoot for her song, New Bay. You know, the song that Hazel was supposed to be shooting the music video for in the first place, but that's neither here nor there. Chanel is in the makeup chair getting her makeup set or whatever. And Hazel walks in and when she sees Hazel, she's like, what are you doing here? Did you come here to ruin another video shoot? And Hazel's like, I don't think I ruined a shoot that, you know, I was producing. And I'm like, um, yeah, you, you definitely, you definitely did. I mean, first of all, you started off wrong by not sending that girl the treatment for the video shoot so that she could be prepared to walk into the situation that she walked into. Now, don't get me wrong. I absolutely think that Hazel is right in one way in the sense that you should be prepared. People that want to be stars these days don't have it like the people back in the day, back in the like the 50s, the 60s, 70s, 80s, the 90s, hell, even the early 2000s. Record companies really molded artists and they groomed them and you had to take, you know, dancing classes and acting classes and um, they made sure that you were a triple threat and that you had it all and that you uh, really were worth their time and their money. And art people don't, um, you know, the record executives and A&R people, they don't really groom artists like they used to back in the day. So in a way, I get what she's saying. Artists these days are kind of spoiled. You know, I back in Beyonce's day when she was coming up, if you come to a video shoot and they say, hey, we're going to learn this eight count, you damn right that you're going to learn eight count and heels in the dirt, whatever. You do that. But Chanel doesn't feel that way. She says, you know, for me, me being prepared, that looks like weeks and days of preparation. I can't just learn an eight count like that. And I see where Chanel's coming from because Chanel is not a dancer. And Hazel coming into the situation to work with Chanel should have known she's not a dancer, she's a rapper. So if she doesn't feel comfortable dancing, she's probably not gonna grasp this choreography, you know, like you need her to anyway. Then we just need to keep it moving and rethink this you know, this scene or whatever. So Chanel tells Hazel, you know what, it's stupid that we're even fighting and arguing. It shouldn't have been like that. And especially like, you know, girls like us or whatever, we're underdogs, we need to stick together. And Hazel's like, you know what, I feel that, I feel you. Hazel apologizes for acting the way she acted. She says that, you know, Chanel, you should have never seen that side of me in the first place. She said that I'm a boss, I'm, but I'm not a bully. So she apologized. Chanel says, oh girl, give me a hug. They hug it out. So they're good again. Everything is all good over there. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about Monique. So Monique's girlfriend, AD, is meeting up with her BFF, Tiffany. The situation is a little weird because Tiffany feels like AD is being taken away from her by Monique. Tiffany even cracks a joke or she says, oh, did you give her some Benadryl? I'm surprised that you, you know, that you were even able to get away. And AD's like, oh, I'll stop it. You know, of course I'm gonna see you. I'm gonna spend time with you. Tiffany says that's just not the way that it's been. Also, Tiffany just does not like Monice in general, so that's a whole other thing. AD tells Tiffany, you know, I'm struggling to try to balance relationship and friendship, and uh, it's just really hard because this is like the first committed relationship that I've really had. But AD tells Tiffany, I will still try to make time for you. And here comes Monice walking in, wrecking the party. I guess that Monice and AD were supposed to go on a date, but that was supposed to be like an hour or so from now. And Monice is mad early, like I said, crashing the party. And Tiffany is obviously irritated by this because she doesn't really say hello or anything. Uh, and Monice is equally as irritated. The vibe with those two was just icy. It was just, ooh, that was cold. That was cold, y'all. Monice is like, you know, can we go? AD's like, no, why don't you stay, have a drink? And she's like, you know, I don't drink. And Tiffany's like, well, there's food, you know, we can stay and eat. Uh, and Monice is like, no, can we go? Well, AD, she apologizes to Tiffany and then her and Monice go off into the night. 
So Monique said at first that Tiffany's vibe was all friendly when she met her, but then it kind of shifted towards jealous. And she just thinks that Tiffany is in love with AD. So Monique and AD are in the car and they're driving and AD's asking Monique, well, why didn't you want to just stay and chill with me and Tiffany? And she says, I know that Tiffany doesn't like me. AD tells Monique, well, Tiffany just feels like you're taking her friend away from her. And Monique says, well, she's just gonna have to get over that. And Moniz tells AD, I think the reason that she acts the way she does is honestly because she's in love with you. And AD is not trying to hear any of that, but AD does admit that her and Tiffany had, they, they tried, okay? She says that they did try, but it just did not work out. So they've been friends ever since. I think she said they've been friends for like, what, like 15 years? AD denies to Moniz that Tiffany feels that way, but Moniz just wants her to kick Tiffany to the curb and be done with it. So then we see A.D. and Cam, who is Moniz and Fizz's son, playing basketball together. And it's such a cute scene. I love that they have completely bonded together. You can tell that they have a really good relationship. Fizz pulls up. I guess he's going to take his son to basketball practice. And A.D. and Fizz, you know, decide to chop it up while Cam goes in the house to get his stuff. Fizz thanks A.D. for helping Moniz out and give, getting her to a good place mentally. He says that she is in a better place than he has seen her in a while. And and she's really been helping her bond with Cam and it's just been a really all around good situation. She asked her how Moniz has been doing and AD says, y'all, you know how Moniz is. You dated her, she's up, she's down, she's all around. But AD says, you know, even though it's been good, we have had, you know, some bad times lately. She tells Fizz about the whole situation with Tiffany and how Moniz feels like Tiffany is in love with her and all that good stuff. AD says it's just been really messing with, you know, it's kind of personal, but our sex life. Fizz says, I don't care about their sex life. I don't care about anything that has anything to go on with them too, as long as it is not affecting my son. So uh, he says that he loves and respects AD and she loves and respects him. So, you know, they all good in his book. As long as his son is happy, that's all that he cares about. And I'm like, that's what's up. That's all that really matters at the end of the day. He didn't really give her any advice on how to deal with this whole Moniz situation, but I don't think there's really any way that anybody can prepare for Moniz. That's no shade. That's not saying anything bad. I think that there are just some people, they are a lot to handle. I'm definitely one of those people myself. So we see AD in the strip club and who is she getting a table dance from? None other than her best friend, Tiffany. Cause that's what friends are for. Tiffany says, so I had to call you up to my place of business to see my friend, really, this is what I had to do. And AD says, oh, it's not even like that. And Tiffany says, yes, it is. She says, I really don't get to see you anymore. But AD tells her, you are kind of the one that's made it difficult for me because you don't like my girlfriend and you don't want to be around her. So, uh, you know, that just kind of puts me in a tough spot. And Tiffany says, well, have I made it difficult or has your lying girlfriend made it difficult? And AD's like, well, what has she lied about? That's why I don't understand. You're always saying that she's lying, but you don't ever tell me what she's lying about. So Tiffany says, well, first of all, she's lying about being a lesbian. And I'm like, first of all, that's none of your business, number one. See, you're overstepping your boundaries. You can feel some type of way if you want to, but if that's your reasoning for not liking her, then you're dead wrong. Tiffany also tells AD that she feels like AD is the one that's raising Moniz's son now. She says that Moniz doesn't do anything for her son. And AD is defending Moniz. She's like, oh, come on now, don't say that. Yes, she does do things for her son. We hang out with Cam together, all that good stuff. But I just feel like, hmm, Maybe she should have checked Tiffany just a little bit harder. I get the ADs very chill, laid back or whatever, but if you love me, if you really love me, you're not gonna sit here and let your friend dog me out or my parenting skills, you know what I'm saying? You're bringing my child into this. And that's a whole other situation. And I think the AD definitely should have checked Tiffany just a little bit harder because there's no way that Tiffany should feel this comfortable talking about Moniece like this. And AD admits that when Moniz and her were having problems in the beginning of their relationship, she did confide in Tiffany probably a little bit too much. And I'm like, mm -hmm, see, this is a problem, y'all. You cannot tell your friends, even your best friends, all of your business. You have to know to keep some stuff to yourself, especially when it comes to your relationship. But AD tells Tiffany, you need to rock with me no matter what, just like I rocked with you. I mean, how many cover-up cover tattoos have I sat through for you? Like, yeah, come on. 
So Tiffany says, you know what? I will rock with you no matter what. Maybe me and Moni's, you know, and you because I'll sit down and AD's like, are you gonna be cordial? She's like, yeah, I can, I can be cordial. I'm like, mm-hmm. So we see Masika and Monice and they're chilling with Mr. Ray who just got a new house and they're complimenting him on his new home and all that good stuff. And they're happy that he's finally moved back to LA. I guess he's been gone for like, I don't know, five years or something that they said. I think he was out in Atlanta actually. So Monice brings up the fact that Masika didn't help Mr. Ray with his move. And Masika says, well, you know, for one, I'm bougie. Number two, Mr. Ray is not out of the doghouse with me yet. He's still on punishment. And Mr. Ray says, you know what, I do apologize for how everything went down. I should have been more professional. I'm sorry that I let ASAP Rock Bottom bring that side out of me. And he's just super apologetic about the whole thing. Masika accepts his apology. And Moniz tells Ray, you know what, you're not being replaced. But Ray says, I just kind of felt like I was being replaced. So then in walks Mr. Ray's new boo, Mr. Vic DeLeo. And he is cute, y'all. Ooh, that man is Fine. I'm like, yes, Mr. Ray. Go ahead, Mr. Ray. If that's all, if that's all you, if this is real, this just ain't for cameras and all that good stuff, then congratulations, girl. You got it. Vic introduces himself to the girls and then he scurries on and Mr. Ray says he's just so happy. This is the happiest he's been in a very long time. And the girls tell him, you know, you just need to be careful. You need to watch out. Mooney says, you know, you got to be careful because once you get into a committed relationship, your friends become their friends, their friends become your friends, and you don't want to be in the situation I'm in. And Moniz tells them about her whole situation with how she doesn't like AD's best friend Tiffany and how she feels like Tiffany's in love with her. To which Mr. Wright also agrees that Tiffany is in love with AD, but I actually don't get that vibe when I see AD and Tiffany together. I actually do get friendship vibes from them. So Masika says that they are hosting a dinner and they shouldn't have to decide which gay friend to invite to the dinner. So she tells Ray that they need that he needs to make up with Zell and figure it out. And he says, well, I'm willing to do that. But if I have to make up with Zell, then you, Moniz, have to make up with Tiffany and figure this whole thing out. And she says, you know what, I'll keep it cute. I've been planning on keeping it cute. But, you know, if she tries me... So Zell is meeting up with Booby and Fizz. He, they're all at the pool and they're chilling. Booby is telling them, you know, his living situation is a little tough because Keisha still looks good. You know, he still wants him a little piece of that every now and then. And Zell says, yeah, I ain't making it no easier because I always make sure she looking good. You know, Zell styles Keisha Cole. So Fizz says, oh, you know, so Booby, so you dipping back in that sauce? And Booby says, nah, I ain't dipping back in the sauce, none of that. He says, you know, he's found his own place or whatever and Zell says you know we need to have a lituation a porty if you will and uh, so Zell says to them let me show you know how good of a wingman I could be now this whole scene kind of made me a little bit uncomfortable because I felt like Zell was trying so hard like I felt like he was super overcompensating trying to prove his masculinity and I know that he said that he's bisexual or whatever and that's good that's fine and dandy but even just like there's one part where he was like the girl walked by him in a bikini and he was just acting like he just couldn't even focus on the conversation because he was just you know ooh, this bass or whatever the case was and I was just like Ugh. Even the way that he was talking, like, it seemed like he was trying to make his voice deeper and just his whole demeanor just was completely different. And I get that with certain friends you act a certain way, but this, mm, I don't know. And maybe I'm projecting on my own, ex you know, from my own experience. But Booby does say that it's time for him to go because he doesn't want little Booby to get used to having both parents around. You know, as he gets older, if he gets used to that and then they split up, he's going to be feeling some type of way. And I completely agree. I see it where... Him and Keisha are coming from on this and, uh, you know, it's just something that has to be done eventually and it's better to do it now, especially while the child is very young. So Zell the wingman gets in the pool and I guess he seduces these ladies and, you know, with his charm and his sexiness and he uh, convinces them to get out of the pool and all line up and he says, you know, you can have your pick of litter, whatever you want, you know, I got it. And Booby's like, see, that's what I'm telling you, it's my boy Zell. And I'm just like... Ugh, this whole scene but I guess they gonna have like a little you know bachelor party for Mr. Booby for his whole new living situation. Booby also mentions that he did a song with Brooke Valentine and he mentions that you know now that he's a free agent he wants to try to explore that relationship. He tells Fizz that this is the happiest he's been since he signed his NBA contract and I'm like you know what 
If you like it, I love it. It's not like we haven't seen this the whole relationship coming since the first episode. So then we see Keisha and Booby. They're out to dinner. Booby decided to take Keisha out to dinner because she deserves it. He just wants to show her his appreciation. So they sit down and he tells her, baby, I found a place. I'm finally going to fly the coop. And she's like, oh, Lord Jesus, yes, my baby, my baby. Uh, no, but she was like, I was cracking up because she was like, waiter, the finest champagne. But that was a cute little scene. They have a great little relationship. I love seeing them, you know, even just talk about how their family, you know, they're gonna love each other regardless. Keisha asked Booby would he have done the same thing for her and if she was the one that cheated and needed to play stay, he says he would. And I'm like, you lying. It's never the same. Girls always, t well, you're not all girls, but most women will take a guy back if he cheats. But I don't think if a girl cheats, a guy is just as willing to take her back. But I don't know, I could be wrong. I've never seen a study done on it. They're talking and stuff and he says, waking up and brushing my teeth to music with my son and just spending all that time together. I don't want that to stop, I want that to continue. And she says, you know what, I'm with all that. He says, I want to make sure that you still get your project, you know, going, you're still doing what you do. She says, yeah, I just have, you know, a couple more things to finish up and then I'm done. He, she asked him how his whole music career, you know, thing is going. He says that it's good. But I noticed that he pretty much failed to mention Brooke Valentine, even the song that he just did with her. And I'm like, hmm, are we being dishonest already? I mean, I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you feel like he should have went ahead and told Keisha that he's talking to Brooke? So Masika and Nia invite Zell to lunch, but they don't tell him that Mr. Ray is actually going to be joining them. So they're all chilling and in walks Mr. Ray. And he seems like he's in a good mood. He sits down. Masika goes ahead and lays out the ground rules. She says there's not gonna be any this, there's not gonna be any that, there's not gonna be any, you know, flying across the table, there's not gonna be any leaps and bounds. And Mr. Ray says, Oh no, I, I can't do that. That's that's all him, you know, he's the flexible one, not me. I was like, is that shade? And Zell, you know, he's just already over Mr. Ray's presence. He says, this fat blowfish is already blowing, you know, smoke out his hole or whatever he said. He was saying, it's amazing that I haven't left across this table and made jumbo sushi out of this blowfish. Like Zell is, he is funny. I gotta give it to him. Like the stuff that comes out of his mouth sometimes is, it just be cracking me up. So Nia says to them, you know, I've talked to both of you on separate occasions and neither one of you really know what the problem is. And Zell says, you know what, I really don't have a problem. You know, all I care about is making money and looking like that. And Mr. Ray says, you know, that's what we should both be caring about. And But he says, you know, I just have to get something off my chest. And he pulls out some paperwork, y'all. He took a page out of Candy from Housewives book and he brought some receipts, okay, that he printed out. So he says, you know, I just got to get this off my chest because uh, I don't want to have an attitude about it, but you have been messaging my boyfriend and I guess he has proof that Zell's been all up in his man's DMs. And Zell says, well, he probably wanted to suck my dick. And Mr. Ray is like, why would he want to suck your dick? And Zell's like, and how much are you paying him? How much are you paying him to be with your fat self? And that completely sets Ray off. So he stands up and he throws his drink at Zell. But poor Nia gets caught in the crossfire. She looked like she was just completely frightened by the whole situation. The security escorts both guys away. Zell comes back to the table. He looks at the screenshots. And he's like, I know who that is. I know that guy. And I'm like, oh, snap. So last but not least, Tierra and Cisco link up to talk about how things went down in their last encounter. Tierra is mad that Cisco came at her sideways when she was just asking him a simple question. Cisco feels like he feels that she was trying to question his loyalty to her. But it's like, mm, man, if the shoe fits, boy, you better wear it. Go ahead, put it on. Is that your size? Is that your size? Okay, it is. It looks like it fits. Go ahead, put that shoe on. But Cisco ends up apologizing to Tierra for the way that he acted and he wants to know how they can move forward without, you know, having problems. And she says, you know, I just want you to answer my questions when I ask them, especially when you come carrying a bone to me. He's like, <laughs> I got your bone. <laughs> <laughs> and Tierra tells him, I just want you to understand. He's like, yeah, you know what, I could do all that. And I was like, either Tierra Marie is a really amazing actress or she is really in love with this dude. Like, this is the happiest I've seen her, I think, in all four seasons of this or all previous seasons of this show. Uh, she really seems like she genuinely enjoys his company and, you know, she's happy, but... It, 
that damn Cisco. But Tierra feels like now that Monice and Nia are out of her business, her and Cisco can move forward. So Cisco decides to take Tierra shopping. He hooks her up with this, uh, you know, renowned stylist. And while they are shopping, the stylist actually has another client in the bag. So he goes to work with her and, you know, Tierra and Cisco, they're talking and kicking it and, uh, out walks the client. And who is that client, might you ask? Don't worry, girl, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you. So that client is none other than Cisco's side piece, Amber Diamond. Yes, Amber Diamond comes out and Sierra has no idea who she is. She has no idea that she's being ambushed right now. And she just starts complimenting her. She introduces herself. She was so sweet. I'm like, see, this is Tierra Marie right here. With the girl y'all be trying to make her out to be putting her in all these effed up situations. That's not Tierra Marie. This, um, you know, for women, her just being sweet and kind and like, girl, you look good. Yes, like you're beautiful. Um, that's Tierra Marie. And that's more of the Tierra Marie that I would love to see on this show. So Amber goes over to greet Cisco and she's like, hey, hey, how you doing? She gives him a hug and he's, he's like, oh, what's up? What's going on? And she's like, what's going on? And Tierra's like, what's going on? So then Amber calls Cisco Bay and Sierra's like, Bay? And she's like, yeah, Bay, that's my dude right there. And <laughs> Sierra points to him like he is a prize on the Price is Right. She's like, uh, no, that's my dude right there. So Sierra's like, Cisco, what is going on? And she's like, really? You came all the way to LA for what? For what? You came all the way to LA for what, Cisco? So Sierra leaves out the shop. Cisco goes behind her following her and Amber is pissed at that. And she starts screaming and crying and she she is actually so freaking beautiful. Even when the girl is crying, she is gorgeous. Like, homegirl is just so fierce. So Tierra gets in the car because I guess security decided that's what's best because she already tried to, you know, fight Amber just a minute ago. And we know that she is not opposed to swinging on a man. So they got her in the car, she's talking to Cisco, and Cisco's trying to explain, you know, he feels like he was justified because they were having problems. He said, you know, she doesn't really mean anything to me. I was just kicking it with her because, you know, she was fun. We were having fun and you've been stressing me out since I got here. And Tierra's like, do you think I'm dumb? Like, do you think that's really a great, a good excuse for you messing around on me? Like, come on. And I'm like, oh, thank God she's smart. Tierra tells him, you know what? We did a hot record. Let's just go ahead and just leave it at that. And he's like, really? That's what you want to do? And um, she's like, and then Tierra's like, no, you did this. You did this, Cisco. And she drives off with her middle thing at so that's all that went down this episode. Let's go ahead and talk about it in the comments. Let me know what you guys thought about this episode and everything that went down. Make sure that you guys follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Stairway to Devin. That is D-E-V-E-N. And follow my Facebook page, Stairway to Devin. I upload some good content on there. Thank you guys so much for watching. I love you for watching. Thanks for being a friend. Bye.